Good morning, everyone, and welcome to New York City and the Mount Sinai Cat Lab. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you guys back. Um, I even forget what number of case this is, but I got to tell you that it's the 16th. Thank you. I was just reminded. It's our 16th live case transmitted on this on www.perflerdimensions.org. Uh, I welcome you to the Cat Lab. We have a great case plan for you today with a lot of great discussion and some great clinical slides and uh, research slides to talk about. But first, I'd like to welcome our team here at Mount Sinai Medical Center. Uh, as always, right next to me is, uh, is Dr. Jose Wiley, who's our uh, Associate Director of Endovascular Intervention. Uh, right next to him is Ray Lascano, our Interventional Nurse Practitioner. And next to him is Anthony Petrella, our, our Outstanding Interventional Fellow, uh, who's going to be graduating in a couple of months. Uh, but uh, I'd like to uh, uh, start by basically talking about uh, this particular case. Uh, it, it's actually a pretty exemplary case in, in which we're going to have Dr. Jose Wiley go ahead and present the slide. Dr. Wiley? Good morning, everyone. Uh, our case today is a 73-year-old female with a past medical history of atherosclerotic uh, coronary disease, uh, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, peripheral arterial disease. The patient had a PCI in the past. And she presented with an increased serum creatinine and difficulty to control her blood pressure over the last six months. The patient had a renal duplex, which uh, revealed a high-grade left renal artery stenosis. And today we'll be planning a left renal artery intervention. So I think, uh, you know, as, uh, the beauty of this case is I think we have a lot to talk about in this case in today's environment. And I think it would be a very interesting for us to really engage in this discussion. First of all, some, some clinical uh, information. The patient has high-grade renal artery stenosis. She has bilateral renal artery stenosis. So the creatinine, the first time we did her renal stent on, on the right, uh, we, but we went ahead, the creatinine at that time was 2.8, now it's dropped to 1.6, just with good technique. Number two, her, her blood pressure has come down to 150 from about 190 to 200. However, she has, we have good ambulatory blood pressure monitoring on her, and you have an increase in blood pressure um, during the day on her. N number four, we have a duplex velocities here at Mount Sinai, which, which reveal a peak systolic velocity of 384, just proximal to the, uh, or just at the stenosis and 534, right, right? Or five something, just distal to the, to the, uh, to the stenosis. So clearly a high grade um, contralateral or left renal artery stenosis. Uh, as far as approach to renal stenting, I think there's a lot of controversy. I think when Dr. Dangus gets, uh, gets settled in, we're, we're, we're going to talk about it. Uh, the, the, the beauty of, uh, of this particular case is, I think this is one of the few cases in which I think there's a lot of consensus on whether we should, how we should treat these patients. The, uh, this patient has atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis, bilateral renal artery stenosis, worsening hypertension, had actually an episode of flash pulmonary edema in the, in, the, in the last year prior to us making the diagnosis, and has, has two high-grade renal artery stenosis. So, so with, with all that being said, uh, you know, I think the, the definitive treatment for these patients is renal artery revascularization. Now, now the, 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 there's a lot of controversy regarding the, re the recent trials, or I should say uh, trials that have been discussed in, in a lot of the meetings, Astral being one of them, obviously. And uh, I mean, obviously you have Van Gers World trial in the New England Journal many years ago, but, but, I, th but I think we have a recent trial, the, 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 the Hercules trial that was presented, and obviously all of us are all holding our breath uh, waiting to hear what Coral is going to show us. Uh, I, th I think the major challenges of renal artery stenting, I think I'm going to ask Dr. Wiley uh, his opinion on this, uh, I think the major challenges of renal artery stenting are, are simple. I think number one and foremost is that it, 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 it is patient selection. I think the appropriate patient will, will result to the appropriate result that you want. For instance, our renal stenting volume here at Mount Sinai Cat Lab has gone way down from, uh, from, from when we first got here because of obviously our, our, our own um, internal data looking at what works and what doesn't work. And, and basically what, what we've decided upon is, 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 is a few characteristics that, that really, really work. One is uncontrolled uh, hypertension on at least three meds and one of them including a diuretic. Has to be there. Number two, you have to have uh, unilateral renal artery stenosis. <laughs> That's significant. One of the major problems with a lot of the randomized controlled trials that were done was that was that the, the renal artery was not significant, meaning it was less than 50, or 50 percent or less than 60 percent. <coughs> excuse me, by, by duplex and criteria. Can they hear me? 
So, so I also my endographic core lab review. So I think it's very important not to get fooled with by, by your eyes when, when you take a picture. I think you need to stop. I think you need to send the patients to the lab and then and then do a duplex in a reliable lab and then decide or do you know a, a quantitative measurements in the cardiac cath lab using a measuring ball. Number three, I think you have to have a multidisciplinary approach. I think nephrology needs to be involved. I think you need to you need to speak to nephrology and and make sure that that you're following the the the, um, the, the, the correct indication for these patients. A lot of these times, uh, these, these patients, despite having renal revascularization, may progress their uh, their their kidney function uh, to to uh, to worsen. So therefore, they're they're going to need nephrology involvement, uh, you know, at some time in, in their lives. And four is to have a very good surveillance program. I think with, with any sort of intervention that you perform, I think in order to become a, a, an expert in your particular area, in your particular uh, locale in which you're practicing, I think it's important for you to follow these patients, not just stent them and let them go, and then if they reach the nose, come back to you. No, I think you need to have a relationship with these patients, follow them along with their primary care or their nephrologist or whoever it may be, and then ba basically intervene appropriately when, when, when you do have restenosis, albeit low in, in this particular um, arterial vent. Uh, now, having said that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just uh, go over our angiogram very, very quickly. These now, are all great points, uh, PK. Uh, let me welcome everyone uh, into this uh, vascular uh, webcast and uh, let me remind everyone that they can send us questions at the uh, website that they are following this. Um, and we're going to be addressing them and uh, asking um, and asking you and asking others uh, their opinion regarding the questions we get from the audience. It's uh, definitely a controversial topic. Uh, the indications are, uh, are always uh, in, in question and in debate. There is a uh, question regarding the non-invasive testing and what's appropriate and what is reliable, most, most importantly. And then obviously we're going to have the technical aspects that we're going to outline in this, uh, in this, um, in this uh, case uh, review with, uh, with PK. Uh, very nicely. Um, so at every step of the presentation, uh, you know, PK is going to take a little bit of a, you know, a little time and we're going to have a, uh, some discussion regarding all the various findings. So let's look at the angiogram, uh, at the angiogram first. Absolutely. So Jose, if you can go see minus here. Um, so before minus. So I, 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 obviously in this patient, we know what we want to do. We want to do um, um, a actual renal stent here. We came here with the in intention of doing renal stenting. So, so, so what we decided to do is, is not to go up and do a flush aortogram, George, like we normally do in terms of making the diagnosis. We know she's got this. We know we have ultrasounds uh, in this particular patient, and we were very confident because we had done the contralateral stent, obviously, a few months ago. So, so, so when we go up in these kind of cases, and I've talked about this, in the past, in our FMD case that Dr. Dangus, I, myself, and Dr. Wiley did a while back now, uh, I think the key is how you're going to engage the renal artery. Uh, uh, you know, basically, I'm going to have Dr. Wiley go over the two techniques of engaging of the renal artery, and I'm going to have Dr. Dangus to share his thoughts as well. Jose? Yeah, well, as you see in this case, uh, uh, PK went up with a uh, seven French uh, guide catheter, probably a PK1 guide, and he has a 035 wire up in the aorta. So what he does is that at having that 035 wire up in the aorta distally, he, he then places a 014 uh, wire, likely a, uh, a mailman uh, wire. No. Mm -hmm. no, that's the next one. And he will advance that wire, as you'll see now, into the renal artery. As soon as the, uh, the wire has traverses the stenosis, then he will pull the 035 wire and the guide catheter will engage. The beauty of this uh, technique is that while you're trying to get your wire in, your guide catheter is not touching the ostium of the renal artery. As you, you know, most of this disease is aortorenal disease. So there is an increased risk of dissecting the artery and then you won't be able to engage. The second technique is uh, the um, um, telescopic. telescopic technique, which basically what you do so you have a five French uh, diagnostic uh, catheter, such as an IM diagnostic catheter, inside of a guy catheter or a sheath. You then engage with that diagnostic catheter, which has a soft tip, advance your 014 wire, and then you slide over the uh, seven French or six French uh, guy catheter. At that time, you then pull out your diagnostic catheter and then go ahead with your intervention. Well, uh, uh, Jose, you raise a very important point. 
six, seven, six, six French or seven French. We used to do those with eight French way back when. Right now, all the renal stents are compatible with the six French essentially. So, given the, the risks you, you identified for possible dissection of the ostium, and more importantly for scraping up and down the aorta, a smaller catheter is preferable. And uh, pretty much uh, every intervention now is is is, uh, is uh, done with a six French sheath right. uh, uh, and a six French guiding catheter unless there is a special there's a special issue. I, I think uh, here, George, we went with a seven French. First of all, it's a live case. We figured we we want to inject dye around whatever stent we used or whatever process we wanted to do. Normally, I think Dr. Dong Dangus makes a great uh, point. Uh, in this lab, uh, we majority of the time all our renal interventions are done with six French guiding catheters. Um, obviously, there are six French sheets available as well. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the different catheters you have available to engage the renal artery. Uh, you know, well, you know, I think uh, as an interventionist, and I know we're going to have a varied audience. So if this is uh, if this is a little basic for some of you. I just want you to hang in there and just, just hear us out. Um, you know, I think if you're going to use the telescopic technique, I, I, what Dr. Wiley went over in terms of engagement of the renal is extremely important. Now you can use anything as simple as a 5 French GR4, or, or if you have a difficult uh, ostium, you can use complicated or more complex catheters such as the Metagemate catheter or, or such as the Omnisos catheter. The Omnisos catheters are basically curved catheters which you have to form up, in, up in the, a little bit higher than the renal, pull it down and actually engage the renal and then pull the catheter for the catheter to prolapse into the renal. They have extremely soft tips which, which allow you to go ahead and you know cross any difficult lesions. Now in this particular lesion you have a very high grade lesion. So in this lesion obviously you, you really run the, the risk of what Dr. Dangus talked about which is actually plaque shifting. So I think you know when you see lesions like this I know we're very adept as at least coronary interventions are out there are very adept at you know engaging most osteo with the coronary. The renal osteo can be very finicky. I mean I think if you do enough of these you will run into issues uh, you know I, I hope it never happens to any one of us where, where, where you close the renal osteo but we We've obviously heard about things like that and have had actually one happen to us here at Mount Sinai. So, so I, I can tell you that, that these are things that are very real, even though they, they may seem kind of remote. And we all, we, everybody always feels it doesn't happen to me, but if it does, it becomes a real painful thing. Number two is the indications are important because not only opening the vessel is important here, you're looking for a physiologic outcome. I think the physiologic outcome, what you're looking for here, <coughs> is extremely important because you obviously have a patient with worsening renal, uh, renal function, you obviously have a patient with worsening hypertension. Our goals of therapy here, stabilize the renal function if we can and control the hypertension we can. So what are the things we control here? We control technique, we control use of dye, we control uh, you know sizing of stents. So why, why are those things important? Well technique we already talked about in terms of how we're going to engage the vessel. Use of dye obviously makes sense because we want to reduce the amount of dye load which is going to re reduce the nephrotoxic effect. And obviously the sizing of stents and other things which I'm going to briefly touch on. The sizing of stents with renal artery stenosis is very, very simple. One, the greatest risk of renal artery stenting other than perforation or, or dissection as we talked about is distal embolization. So we're going to spend a little time talking about filters here, but, but at, the, at the same time currently you, you want to follow quick techniques. So usually we do not predilate unless we feel that, that, that there is a absolute need or something that we're worried about and we look at angiographic as well as fluoroscopic reasons to predilate. Number two is, is, is as far as uh, the sizing of the stents. We know with renal stenting it's very, very clear. One-to-one -one stenting results in your, your best patencies. Greater than one-to-one -one is, is going to result in a possible risk of perforation. Less than one-to-one -one is going to result in unfavorable restenosis. So, so sizing may be important. And, and number three is going to be distal protection. Well, there's no real renal filters out there that are made. We do know in solitary functioning kidneys, in, in obviously obvious thrombus at the ostium of the renal, these are the kind of areas where you may consider filters. But, but we believe that there may be a role for the Medtronic Fibronet filter in, 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 this, kind, in this kind of re, re, renal, uh, renal artery, which obviously has a high creatinine as well as a very, very atherosclerotic tight lesion. So in this case, George, I think that, I don't know if you would agree, I think Dr. Wall and I discussed this earlier, because of the nature of the lesion is extremely tight, we do want to predilate. Okay, and we want to go forward. But right before, we, you know, I just want to talk about your thoughts. I'm yeah. going to go and pre just get the Hercules slides ready to just. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that I have uh, different thoughts in every in every item. 
Um, uh, first of all, I find that uh, sizing of the appropriate stent is, is not so easy in renal arteries. For the example we can see over here uh, right now. Uh, after the stenosis, there is a very uh, fat part of the renal artery which includes a postenotic dilatation. And then further down, the renal artery tapers a little bit. So the question is one-to-one -one sized against what? Definitely not the post dilation part. So in the early days, uh, we have actually published a, a first experience with IVUS guided uh, renal artery stenting that uh, performing intravascular ultrasound was extremely safe and can accurately assess the uh, uh, the uh, diameter of the renal artery after the post dilatation area. If we have that, then indeed a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, expansion of the stem can be achieved. On the other hand, there is always a trick into uh, navigating a, a metallic stem across this uh, uh, very tight lesion. So uh, a soft predilation with a photo balloon, which is definitely going to be undersized, um, has few advantages. Number one, allows um, allows us to understand exactly what the size of the story is, and if the uh, four is uh, way too small, we can go towards a six balloon, or if the four may not be, may doesn't seem that small compared to a distal vessel, we may settle for a five or a 5.5 stent. Uh, secondly, allows a little bit more of understanding of how the logistics of the expansion during the stent is going to be. For example, because the lesion is too tight, uh, we can see the balloon flying forward or backward uh, during the inflation a little bit, and obviously this is a much better thing to, uh, to understand how it's going to work uh, rather than having your first experience with the stent. And third, in my, in my experience, it allows in the very difficult angulations to actually advance the guide over the balloon as it, uh, as it deflates and, uh, you know, perhaps uh, uh, allow a better position of the guide. I must say that uh, doing this technique is a little bit uh, safer with a six-front sheath, uh, with a six-front guide. Uh, but can definitely be achieved with a 7 as well. The, the current uh, uh, quality of the guide catheter tips is quite so soft that they can actually perform the, uh, the, uh, this uh, kind of uh, maneuver, um, you know, up and around despite the 90 degree turn. Uh, the, and, and the final aspect regarding the, the filters is that they're a function, their utility can be a function of uh, how long the main renal artery is. For example, in this particular case we're facing today, there is about a 30 or 40, I would say, uh, maybe even a 50 millimeter length of renal artery before it bifurcates, which is a little bit unusual, but at the same time is very adequate uh, for a filter placement. Uh, sometimes the bifurcation is very early on, or the, the, the vessel is angulated, tapers in a funny ways, and you really cannot reliably place a filter uh, in a safe situation let alone that then the filter wire, which is not as strong, may, may uh, become the, uh, the only wire that you have uh, in order to track your stent into the vessel, and that may also pose some, some difficulties. Uh, PK, you have some other uh, yeah, uh, to show us? some slides, George, and we'll, we'll start the case. So I, I was going to talk here about the Hercules trial, uh, which I think is the latest trial that's been presented, uh, by, obviously, and published by Dr. Jaff and, uh, and all the Hercules investigators. And basically, I think I think this trial really, uh, in my opinion, and I do mean my opinion, represents uh, you know the, the the patient subset that really benefits from from renal stenting. And I think we have very strong data with this particular multicenter trial to be able to talk about at least uh, the patients who probably fit the best criteria for renal stenting. Um, you know, so so if you look at this particular trial, it's basically the objective is to evaluate the safety and effectiveness of this particular stent in the in, in the treatment of suboptimal post PTA results of atherosclerosis de novo or uh, renal artery stenosis patients with uncontrolled hypertension. 202 patients, 37 U.S. sites from August 07 to 09. Primary endpoint was a very hard endpoint of a nine-month restenosis rate performance. Uh, performance goal was obviously the standard, which is around 28.6 percent uh, if you could pull all the trials together. And clinical lab and DUS uh, follow-up at 1, 6, 9, 12 months, 2 years, and 3 years. And interestingly, because you know there was a paper out of Ashna Clinic that looked at BNP measurement <coughs> in, in the effect uh, of, uh, of renal, renal stenting and the control of front hypertension. So there's been a lot of talk about that as we've discussed here. So clearly they also looked this in, uh, at this in a, in a randomized fashion. 
So if you look at the key endpoints, they looked at recent doses rate greater than 60% by duplex or angiography, which I think I think is, is, a, is a good hard endpoint. Safety is very important, as we talked about, especially Astral and uh, you know other trials out of Europe. They, they've had a lot of perforations, a lot of you know failed procedures, things that you and I uh, and Ho Dr. Wiley really don't normally talk about uh, in these kind of cases. And God willing, we never have to talk about those kind of the wire purse, et cetera, et cetera. But you know they are real complications. But they did look at safety endpoints in, in terms of composite of death, they still had a nephrectomy, atherombolic renal disease at 30 days, and clinically in, in indicated TLR at 270 days. And secondary endpoints for acute procedural pursuit, success, and I think very, very importantly, alteration in blood pressure and antihypertensive medications, as well as renal functions, predictive value of BMP we mentioned, and primary and, um, and primary assisted patency rates and clinically driven TLR. I think a lot of really good stuff. But what I think is important is right here in this particular particular slide, is that they, they took real patients, and I mentioned our Monsanto criteria that we follow, which is three antihypertensive meds with blood pressure greater than 150, and they, they, they looked at systolic blood pressure greater than 140, or diastolic blood pressure greater than 90, or a combination of both in the presence of at least two antihypertensive medications. <laughs> Serum creatinine less than 2.5, obviously, here's a patient, obviously, who has a, our patient has 1.6 at this time, but was high as 2.8. And, and also the percent diameter stenosis, again, is extremely important because the ocular stenotic reflex, when you look at a stenosis, in, in our eyes, at least we know with the peripheral vasculature, we tend to overestimate stenosis um, rather than underestimate them. So therefore, when you measure them, I think, or you have a core lab analysis in, in most of the trials, it's proven that, that patients were stented either at or below 50%. But here, obviously, greater than 60% renal artery stenosis was there and on, was the inclusion criteria. And obviously, we're talking about suboptimal PTA which in my opinion is controversial, but we'll talk about that. Uh, as far as baseline characteristics, again, I want you to really look at the, 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 the mean uh, blood pressure of 162 in these patients. And these are patients who had at least two antihypertensive agents and had a mean blood pressure of 162, diastolic blood pressure on 78, an average number of antihypertensives, even though the inclusion criteria was two, they were about 3.4 plus minus 1.3. And again, serum creatinine was, was obviously not abnormal, and the GFR was also uh, 61.5. And, and you know, anatomy, they looked at bilateral renal artery vascularization. Obviously, atherosclerosis is a systemic process, and bilateral renal artery stenosis also is this, it can occur in these patients. <clears throat> if you look at the mean percentage diameter, you know, again, by core lab review, 65.9 real lesions, heavy calcification, again, because of what Dr. Wiley said was the uh, inclusion of the aortic plaque, 27% uh, uh, real ca heavy calcification, <clears throat> lesion length, 8.5, and reference vessel diameter, 5.5. Now, what they found was, in terms of the binary restosive rate, um, again, obviously using the appropriate patients and the appropriate <coughs> techniques, that they had a wonderful uh, low restosive rate of 10.5 with a p-value of less than 0 0.001, which, as we know, good renal stenting really does, uh, you know, give you good results, George, as you and I both know. But, but clearly, if you look at key safety endpoints, which I think is important at this, in today's day and age of renal stenting, I'll tell you why. Because you know you've had all these trials in Europe that have showed, you know, safety that hasn't been, uh, can you hold out to the mailman when you flush please? Uh, uh, what When you have safety endpoints uh, that, that have been not good, especially in terms of having, um, uh, you know, perforation, et cetera, et cetera, and, and leading to nephrectomy, here you see that our safety endpoints were phenomenal. Uh, you know, obviously number of events were very low and event free percentage was also very low. And again, you could, this also shows again the low 30 day safety event rate, which again, extremely low and really clinically non-significant. Now, device success, we also know from Europe in those European trials that they had a failure. They actually had failure of the actual procedure that, that they had performed. But here, device success was 96%, procedural success was 99%, and clinical success was also very, very high. Now, this is what I really want you to talk about is that, is that if you see, if you choose the, the right patients, and I realize it's a single trial, and I realize it's probably an industry-sponsored trial, I'm assuming, but, but the point is here, you look, you look here, if you look at the baseline characteristic, one month, nine month follow-up of the systolic blood pressure, you have a clear, significant drop in the systolic blood pressure all the way through. Diastolic blood pressure remained pretty much the same. GFR, again, remained pretty much the same. And also, if, if you look at the, uh, the greater than three antihypertensives, they started to come off some of the antihypertensive medications, and they were also were able to remain on their ACE and their R and their ARB or their or, or their uh, diuretic use. Okay, so if you look at systolic blood pressure reduction in 77% uh, of patients at nine months, 
you, what you notice is that the worse their blood pressure was was when they started, the 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 the, the, the better that they did. Okay. So so if if, if you if you look at 19% in the greater than 180 group, five the, the, that was reduced to 5%. If 140 to 160, 56 to 36, and 160 to 180, 24 to 19. But the the point is, you you have a greater bang for the buck when when basically you have a reduction of one category of systolic blood pressure, and I think this reflects what, what we we spent a little bit of time on earlier in the appropriate patient selection. So you figure, improved by category, if you had a patient with a blood pressure of 180, met all the proper criteria, you did a good job with the renal stent, and you sized it properly, and you had no complications, well, you know what, you actually have a decrease in systolic blood pressure by 94%, albeit the number was, was, was overall small. But overall, regardless of the category, there was a drop in systolic blood pressure at nine months by one category. Um, unfortunately, there, there was no evidence of correlation. I mean, fortunately, unfortunately, I don't want to say any opinion there because, you know, the truth is that, we, you know, it was a good uh, thought-provoking kind of study to actually look at whether we could look at BNP, which is a non-invasive marker of, of, of whether or not we can make a difference in systolic blood pressure. And you can see here there was no evidence of correlation between baseline BNP and systolic blood pressure change. Um, again, it's the same slide repeated. I apologize. Uh, the, the other thing is the nine-month patency rates, the primary patency rates were extremely acceptable at 88%. And I think this is important for a, you know, a slide to talk to everybody about. I think this trial illustrates you know, the, the, the importance of the follow-up of these patients. If you see these patients at regular intervals do ultrasounds, obviously they'll look at their, their medication list, what their systolic blood pressures are running, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's very important for us to, to, be, able to, to, to be able to detect restenosis early and or also document your patencies. So your nine-month primary patency was 88 percent and your sister patency was 95.2 percent. Again, your uh, freedom from clinically driven TLR in nine months was also low. So in conclusion, obviously it met the primary ob uh, objective of nine-month restenosis rate of 10.5 with a p-value that was extremely um, uh, uh, positive. And also, you have, what I think is important is the physiologic aspects of what we, what we talked about. You have a significant and persistent reduction in systolic blood pressure in patients with multi-drug multi hypertension, in which 70, almost 80% 70, of these patients had a systolic blood pressure reduction. Again, we talked about the decrease in one category, right, of, of, uh, of in, their, in their level of hypertension. And the worse the patient was in terms of their hypertension, the better they seemed to do as long as your, your procedure was done properly. So it was safe. Obviously, you have 1.5% composite safety endpoint in 30 days, which I think is important because I think a lot of criticism that was occurring with renal stenting was that, hey, are we hurting these patients versus not hurting these patients? And however, we also found, importantly, that there was no correlation between pre-procedural BNP levels, change in BNP levels, and clinically important reduction in systolic blood pressure following renal stenting. So obviously, you might want to, they, they suggested further, further studies to uh, analyze this thing further. So I think, you know, overall, I wanted to present that because it's the, it's the latest trial uh, well, that, that, that we have uh, in terms of looking at um, 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 our uh, re renal artery stenting and whether it should be done or not. Well, this is a great, uh, it's a great uh, study, um, uh, PK, because it includes the a, a dedicated renal artery stents, such as a Herculean, as well as employment of the new techniques that we sort of discussed. The limitations of the previous studies uh, of the renal artery stenting was that some of them included even balloon angioplasty, and some of them included the infamous criterion of excluding patients, except for patients who would anyhow benefit from an artery standing, this study will investigate the rest of them, which essentially means that the interventionalists would do stenting in those who would derive the most benefit, and they would only randomize in the studies the wishy-washy cases. And obviously, if you do that, you never have a good outcome versus control. Why? Because for the obvious reason, your case is from the beginning a wishy-washy case. Because otherwise, according to the inclusion and inclusion criteria of those trials, uh, you know, the real artery standing would have been performed anyhow if there was a clear indication. Um, so uh, the, the limitation, obviously, of this study, the Hercules study, is that it is a uh, registry. So there is no control group. But one can say that in a, such a high-risk population with a documented high blood pressure um, in, uh, um, uh, and the 
the necessity to show a low resinosis rate was achieved, only 10%, and essentially a 5% uh, clinical recurrence of any kind, which are great results comparable to those results we have with drug eluting stents in coronary artery disease, which is essentially, uh, we, we never see the patients again. They have the stent, and from that point of view, things are good. And the outcome that's been the most reliable ever since our very first uh, uh, publication uh, 10 years ago with the IVUS guide on artery stenting, we did show at that time the reduction in the number of antihypertensive medications and trends in reduction in systolic blood pressure that essentially study and study afterwards show the same thing, reduction in blood pressure or a reduction in antihypertensive medications, one of those or both. And the results in the uh, creatinine have never been um, uh, very, uh, uh, very easy to show. There have been some suggestions in patients with higher creatinines that perhaps the rate of deterioration is halted by the renal artery standing without a frank documentation of improvement in renal function, and essentially that the field is up for a debate. The more important thing is during the live case uh, that uh, we see now to go over the various techniques we have to use in order to avoid distal embolization of either thrombus or debris during the case as much as possible uh, in, uh, in order to avoid the renal function deterioration. And one of the aspects that uh, uh, we employ is not only the, the discussion possibility of filter that I said technically is really not achievable in most cases, is uh, the accuracy, the speed, and the avoidance of repetition. Essentially what I mean by that, if you keep losing your wire and you have to go back again and re-engage your renal artery and pass your wire again and this and that, obviously you maximize the, 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 the amount of time you're touching the artery, uh, the ostium and the amount of debris you're through following through. Similar happens if you, your stents doesn't go, you have to retrieve it and try again, or you bang the artery quite a bit in order to pass the equipment. So as much as possible, this procedure has to be smooth and fast. So let's go up with PK now and uh, Jose Wiley to tell us how it's going. We can see the guide catheter and we can see the mailman wire into the main artery. And by the way, PK alluded to that, you have to make sure that the wire doesn't fly into the distal part because if uh, sometimes it may uh, it may embolize and uh, kind of hit and micro perf the, um, uh, the renal parenchyma. So that's another aspect you have to be really careful in holding wire position, but at the same time not um, uh, not letting it fly further. <coughs> Another aspect that PK hasn't sh hasn't told us yet, but I see it already: the choice of the sheath. The choice of the sheath is uh, sometimes in order to uh, to have a better uh, alignment of the guide and a better support of the guide, we choose a 25 cm. Uh, uh, sheath uh, in order to take out the uh, iliac uh, tortuosity as opposed to the 10 cm, 10 centimeter uh, short sheaths that uh, may make the guide uh, a bit more uh, uh, curved around the iliac arteries mm -hmm. and um, you know may not make it as easy to manipulate or may not make our uh, entire equipment as sturdy as possible and provide as backup uh, as possible when we try to advance mm -hmm. equipment. So George, um, so we talked, you alluded to the filter there, so what, what we decided to use is a FiberNet filter. And I don't know how many of you out there have used the FiberNet filter. It's actually a very nice filter for renal artery stenting in our, in our humble opinion because it gives you the ability to be able to place a filter in without, without halfway. What are you doing? Uh, oh boy. So as you can see, first of all, uh, it is PK is placing the filter uh, with uh, uh, maintaining the wire first. Okay. So uh, again, once you put a wire on in the artery, uh, um, it is important to uh, maintain it there in order for your guide not to back up. Right, it, it, and also I think George, that's a great point. And also, what we did is we're placing a fiber net filter here, which is also a little bit more bulky than your regular. Um, you know, in terms of actually it's less bulky, but the problem is with such a tight lesion, you may not yep. be able to wire this uh, exactly. without it. What's our ACT guys now? 300, okay. So I'm, um, I'm obviously, I already ruined my tip, so it's gonna be even more challenging for me to try to get this in. So let me see, because we had a little bit of trouble, surprisingly, with our, with our, uh, with our, uh, what is it called, uh, our TUI. So let me straighten this out here. And then let me see if uh, God is kind to me. And yeah. 
seems like God is today, He is kind to me as always. And so we're, we're in today with, with the filter. Good. Oh, it, it, it is actually great to, have, okay, to, to, to advance it with a J tip because it won't perf. That's great. Right. Uh, actually, that's a good point in some ways. So, so I think <laughs> now that I'm, and I'm, I'm distal, I'm going to pull out my, my mailman. And I want all of you. I want all of you to look for the markers of this filter, uh, which I'm not able to see yet. Hold on a second. Did you pull the mailman or did you pull the, uh, no, pull I pulled the, the filter? filter by mistake. Yeah, okay, and let's do it. Okay, good. I'm going in now. Let's again. advance. We can see it just the at, the, at the curve of the guide. Yep. Now, uh, now I'm going to pull the mailman out. And somehow they, they kind of pull each other out. Right? That's, they're there. That's the right one. No, line. they so pull we, each other out. Well, you know, sometimes they get tangled, George. Yeah, you know. that's what it is. Yeah, you know, that's why, the, um, you know, they, they move up and down a little bit. You know what? Is that the filter in there? No. Okay. Okay. Nope. We pulled the wrong wire out. We're going to go back in again. Well, maybe we can take this time to show us a filter a little bit outside the body. Maybe maybe we, we need to see a little bit of filter, uh, Jose. You want to hold it against something blue so we can see it. And the camera, please zoom in the, the filter so we can see how it looks. Oh, hold on. We got to dip it back in, uh, in heparinized saline now. Yeah. Come. Let's oh, re-prep it. Let me, I think there's a value to see how we prep the, the filter. Well, you know, and, you know George, uh, I'm glad this happened because yeah. the, the challenge of this filter is actually visualization. So you can see <laughs> the, the visual challenges we're having in seeing this filter in such a difficult case. So, so you know, now, now, now that we know which, which color wire is which, and we've studied it carefully, especially normally when we use this filter, we go directly with the wire. But in this particular filter, uh, you know, we have two wires, and uh, you know, this is the first time we're doing this kind of case because of the support we felt we would need in order to get the filter down. So now we're going to make sure that we don't pull our mailman out, and we are we have not. I'm going to loosen my tui here. It's going to bleed quite a bit, and that's part of the unfortunate thing about these things. And then we're going to go ahead and insert our our filter cheater in. Oh, you're yeah. using a regular tui, not the co-pilot. Yeah, okay. but unfortunately, this doesn't fit very well in a co-pilot. And then I'm going to get this way in, and I'm going to walk this out with Dr. Wiley's help. Well, and sometimes, you know, I got to tell you, you, you have to use two uh, two operators to get things done properly. Yeah. Which uh, which is exactly what we're doing here. Jose, why don't, why don't you put a, a torquer at the mailman so you always know what the mailman is? Yeah, in the I have it. I'm ho holding yeah. it right now. Yeah. So we don't confuse it. So we, we we no longer need to see the hands of the operator, please. Very good. Let's focus now at the turn of the guy, at the curve of the guy. You see the mailman is nicely positioned into the lower branch of the of the kidney uh, artery. Um, actually, yeah, can we advance the mailman just a little bit to show us that the, sure. where that bifurcation is? Because I want to make a point here in that this case is adequate for filter exactly because the mailman artery is long. Okay, if the bifurcation was occurring, that's beautiful. Uh, that's bif our filter. Yeah. Now we're pulling the There you wire. go. The mailman is okay. out now. We're pulling the mailman out? Mailman is out now. Okay. It's the real mailman. Now we've got the filter distal, which I'm just going to advance it even further. Yeah, it's okay. a very good thing that is actually a little bit of a curve there. Maybe a little bit too big of a curve to go into the distal vessel. And uh, now, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and show you how to deploy this filter. Obviously, forgive the, the bleeding here. It's a little bit of bleeding because of... We the, don't see that. We only well, see the angio. Well, I'm just saying that because of the uh, TUI that we're working with, and uh, Dr. Wiley's just keep getting the wires out of the way, so this way we don't get uh, confused. Stay. Yeah, yeah. Good. Um, okay. Okay, so now, Good. now in, in a second, we're going to, so now that the filter wire is across, we're going to take a little picture to see where, where, that, where the wire is. Can we do it on coronary, guys, so I can see it? Sure. Now, I'm going to try to identify the markers. Ready? Mag up, please. So there should be two markers, a proximal and a distal marker. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I actually have one more room that I can advance this, which I'm going to now. Right? I'm actually going to yeah. advance it. There's our proximal and our distal marker here. I'm going to try to get rid of this loop if I can. 
doesn't seem like it wants to cooperate. Or may, maybe it can go to one of the arteries is bigger, one of the branches is a little bit bigger than the others. If you like it to go into that one of them, it actually may go. Uh, there you go. There you go. That's now I have right. a nice proximal and a distal marker. Yeah. Right? And uh, I'm just going to go very, very slowly. Let it advance slowly, like right, right about there. And I think it's and important to maintain another, the loop. Let's just take another picture to make sure how much room we have. Okay, inject. Okay, so now we got the filter safely in a nice area. I personally would like it a little bit further. What does anybody else think? Yeah, at least it's right after the post and well, A little bit more, right? I would go a little bit more here if, if I can. If, if we can, that would be good because, uh, you know, they always tend to back up a little bit with movements. I think that's kind of nice right there if I can leave it right there. It's a little uncomfortable looking, but I think I'm okay with that there. So now, <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and deploy this filter, and I just want you guys to come back to me here, and this is where we're gonna work with our, with our, um, our deployment device. Now, Medtronic is kind enough to give us this piece right here. Okay, look at it over there. So this particular piece right here, I, for lack of a better word, I call it my deployment device. So this is where we're gonna deploy the device. We're gonna place, <clears throat> the wire into this as far as it goes. Once it goes far, and then you have resistance, you're gonna stop, and then you're gonna open the lid, okay? Once you open this lid, what happens is that the device locks, okay? I can't pull it out now. Now I want you to look carefully at this. The two markers are important because we talked about the two markers. Right. What happens is this filter deploys distal to proximal. So what happened is it, it, it'll crunch forward, okay, and the distal marker will get close to the proximal marker. So therefore, you're not going any further distal with this particular device. So, so here, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the proximal marker right there, right? And the distal marker is right there. Yeah, we can okay. most, most clearly see the proximal right. marker, and we can, I think, uh, I understand now where the I'm distal is. I'm going to go ahead and open it, which is basically <laughs> twisting this to the other side. Yep, you have to press the red button, which is a lock and then twist. You see that? See how the wire kind of kicked forward, guys? Yeah. That is the deployment of the filter. You can't see the filter. The filter is located between the two markers, so you're ready to go. Now, all I'm gonna do is close this. Oh, the my moment I close this, it, un it releases my wire. See, now my wire is off. Now I can do my work. Get the IVIS ready, please. Now, and may I ask, what no, is the sizing of this filter you're using? Uh, this is this is a five six filter, George. Okay. They obviously come in, I believe, two the three three to five, five to six, and six to seven. So we chose a five six filter because we felt that is the Ibis? Yes. Because we felt that there will be a distal, uh, you know, besides mismatch. So now I'm going to go with the Ibis catheter as you talked about. I just asked Elizabeth because of the duration of the case to give another thousand units of heparin. So we, we're always cognizant of our of our uh, coagulation regimen, right? So Dr. Wiley and I are gonna work together to try to get this filter across, I mean to get the IVIS across and get a nice IVIS measurement. Oh, I know, I'll take care of it. A nice IVIS measurement. So right now we're just bringing the IVIS closer and the filter's deployed nicely. I've got my eye on the markers, George. I think the markers are the key here in terms of telling you where you are. IVIS is going in slowly. Obviously, you know, I wanna just warn the coronary guys, don't, you know, go with the markers that you have because those are mostly coronary markers. <clears throat> you know, if you do that, you may shove the IVUS all the way through the vessel. Yeah, what type of IVUS equipment are you using, by the uh, way? You know, you know, George, obviously you can use any equip IVUS equipment, but here we're using Volcano because we're right here and we have a Volcano lab here that's yeah, available. I, I think actually it's important to use the Eagle Eye uh, if you can. So I'm uh, just going to go a little distal here, which I think I'm distal yeah. enough, George. What do you think? Yeah, I think I think so. Yeah, you okay. go. Can you show Dr. Dangus the ibis, please? So yeah, very is, good. This is distal. I'm just going to do a manual pullback. Why don't we um, freeze this and take a measurement here, guys? We have our ibis key. So here. this seems to be a five okay. by six right, artery. So, so play it here. Uh, play it live, please. We can measure later. Save this. Play essentially, you see a normal that, artery. I'll just with mark a, that, and I'm going to just pull it back now. You can across. see a, you can see a normal artery with not much uh, atherosclerosis, about a between five and six um, millimeters in diameter. It pulls out now, becomes a much bigger. This is now the posterior dilatation, and, and this is the is lesion, lesion that you see, super the tight at the ostium. And look right at the ostium, and now I'm back into the guide. So let's uh, let's measure those guys, and I just want to know what the 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 lesion is, right distal to the, uh, what is it called, uh, 
uh, to the stenotic dilatation. Uh, Dr. Wiley is going to walk this back carefully for me without advancing that filter. So let's go first to the very to the beginning of the pullback, please. Go all the way up, all the way up, right uh, right there, and measure here. Even even further up, even further up. Yeah, a little more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, oh, no, no, it's not that. It's, quite, it's a little bit bigger. Yeah, All right. a little bit bigger on that, so on that side, yeah. So it's about a 5.4 by 6.1, which is what we had thought might be a 6 millimeter stent here. So we're going to go with it. We're going to pre-dill this because of the, uh, the calcium that we see on the shadow and the fact that we have a filter. So give me a 4 millimeter coronary balloon, guys. Yeah. So we're going to go with a 4.0 coronary balloon. We initially thought 5, but I think because of the fact that we have a, a good, uh, uh, you know, IVA sizing, as Dr. Jen Dang has so nicely suggested. Yep, 4015 coronary balloon is going in. Yep. Now we have our filter distally to protect us. And again, the key is these filters are not benign. You know, the wire distally can cause issues. You have to keep an eye on your distal wire. You have a big J loop here, which is not optimal, but like George said, maybe safe enough for us to do this work. So let's go back to the IVUS team if they want to measure us the lesion and they show it to us. Right, right, right there. Right. Which is... See this guide, guide is good, filter is good, everything is good. Now remember guys, those of you doing the interventions out there, you want to be able and to... measure the, the real vessel outside here. Yeah, you can, can see how much plaque is there over there. Uh, it, it's actually outer, it's actually more in the towards the 9 o'clock is outside. Okay, got it. It's much bigger on the towards 9 o'clock. Yeah, it's out there, yeah. So we're going to go with the balloon, and, uh, and George, we're actually proceeding as we talk. The yeah. balloon is definitely across the lesion. A little puff, please. Okay, so let's go back to the angio to see. It's clearly a highly stenotic lesion. Okay, good. We're right across the lesion here. Okay, All I'm right. just going to go up. We'll have to back up the guide a little bit. I will. Yeah, that's a normal up. procedure. Uh, uh -huh. Always, uh, we need a backup uh -huh. support of the guide in order to deliver the balloon, but then the guide normally comes up comes back as you uh, So as we you rebuild it with the filter protection. You can see we have a nice filter protection there distally. And you see how this filter really works well even in the tightest of stenosis. So now we're just going to let George said advance our guide forward. And now again, I'm going to fix my filter. Again, I, you know, having a filter and having a jerk back and forth is not a wise thing either. So, you know, we're going to go ahead and come out slowly with this. Obviously, it adds a little bit of technical difficulty. And Dr. Wiley is going to go ahead and walk this filter out for me. I mean, I'll watch the balloon, excuse me, while I open the, uh, the TUI for him and stay on fluoro. TUI's open. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's important to mention that when uh, you deflated the balloon, you advance the guide, that's important, so you're able to then advance your stent and not get stuck behind the lesion. So let, let's go back to the IVUS measurement of the lesion, please, so I understand what is the vessel size in that area. Good. So the, uh, the vessel size in that area is 5.8 by 6.3 in the media to media. So um, we're again in the same, uh, in the in same, same uh, in the same region that uh, somewhere between a 5.5 and 6.0 uh, millimeter stand is gonna fit. Ready? I don't know which one PK will, will, uh, will, uh, will choose, but also we can all see that uh, a rather short stand can fit here. We do not need to go to a 15 or 18 millimeter stands into this, uh, for yeah, this I, lesion. I think, I think we're just gonna go with a 6.0 short stand here, George. Yeah. I think we'll go with a 6 I just took a little picture just to see what's going on. Everything looks okay. And uh, we're going to go now with a 6 probably. What do we got, guys? Got 12 and 15? Uh, we'll probably go with a 6 15. This is pro probably a little big here, George. We could probably get away with a 12. If we had a 12, that might be, I don't know if it's available, but we not a big a deal. We'll have a 12. So we'll go with a 12. Well, you want to extend a little into the aorta just to flare it well. Well, the, the lesion length is no more than short. 4 millimeters. Yeah. Um, that's 12. So I think you know if you saw if you saw what was happening with our uh, with our uh, did you, is she sedated? She's sleeping. Okay. If, if you saw what was happening with our um, um, struggles with the filter, I think that's part of what happens with these filters that are, we're putting that are actually elsewhere in, in, into into areas where we think they're clinically indicated. You know, as, as much as we're good at what we do, the filters aren't exactly made for this type of vasculature. Yeah. I think having said that, the FiberNet filter is probably the most favorable filter, in my opinion, again, that is my opinion, uh, in, in terms of, you know, if you're going to use 
use pistol protection in these cases, uh, what's the filter that's really going to help you? So here, because of the fact that it, I like the fact that it, it, it actually deploys distal to proximal, so this way you stay out of the distal vessel, uh, because as we know in the renal, you have so many bifurcations and so many lesions, et cetera, et cetera, that the distal to proximal is actually okay. The other thing also is I like with this particular filter is, is, is the fact that uh, you're able to obviously work over the wire very, very comfortably and are also able to, oh boy, this wire's a bit now. Hmm. Ah, there it goes. And, and, and are able to, you know, obviously have enough support to be able to deploy, deploy, deploy your stand and et cetera, well, et cetera. So well, I must say the, the particular anatomy here is very, very favorable and the technique to deploy the filter in the upper branch uh, and maintain the loop is also very important. If the filter is deployed with a wire straight, then there's always a, a more of a movement of the filter and there is also more of a chance to hurt the parenchyma. Right now, we don't need to worry at all about the parenchyma because of the loop. Well, and uh, we kind of feel that the filter is kind of parked there. So this allows us more of a, a attention to be paid into the real, uh, uh, you know, lesion uh, uh, section, as opposed to at the same time try to deliver balloons and uh, keep a, keep an eye on the what's happened with the distal tip of the filter wire. Uh, so, so it's a very nice to see that the most important part of the procedure was just now to see how the stent is actually going to curve out of the guide into the vessel and looks like it has curved very nicely and it's uh, clearly plenty long. You can already see it almost through the uh, uh, post dilation. Yes. Um, uh, the team there backs up the guide and it's going to have some, some non-selective uh, inflations. I out think there. this is pretty good, George. As you see here, we're, we're looking at the distal aspect of I the I think renal. it looks perfect. You, you want know, it uh, a few millimeters into the exactly. aorta and that's what you have. The lower border of the renal artery. Yeah, you can see the lower border of the renal artery is very favorable. It's probably got a little test. Okay, actually, I'm pretty good here, George. We're going to go up. I think let's go up, and, you know, and, and, uh, always an aspect is you're going up. Uh, uh, remember, everybody uh, who sees, you can see that going Six. up very slowly in order to be able to adjust if the uh, uh, moves What's in normal? and out. You can uh, just push or pull okay. the guide a little bit. Micro movements in case uh, it, uh, it deploys uh, um, in an unusual way. And um, uh, I don't know if PK will deploy, will, will do so, but a lot of people will back up the, 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 the balloon halfway out and do another inflation to flare it. That's what he's doing now. He's uh, yeah. flaring the ostium of that, uh, that stent. And I don't do violently, George. I just go up a little bit, and that's it. Down. Can you show me my guide a little bit, guys? Thank you. Now it's important to torque the guide in. Okay, and then, and then sheath it using the balloon as your dilator, just like that. Now you're in, right? Yeah, that's another important maneuver, otherwise the guide may, uh, may fly out of the vessel. Okay. <laughs> now Dr. Wiley's going to walk me out. Because remember, the stent uh, uh, is outside the vessel by a couple of millimeters, so if the guide is flushing the aorta, it uh, kind of, uh, yeah. uh, you know, not exactly in the vessel. But we can see now we're ready to inject right in the mouth of the vessel right after we uh, take out this, uh, uh, this, uh, this equipment uh, over the wire. So, mm -hmm. a little more. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. <coughs> Cycle of cough, guys. Can we go in a in a um, in the coronary setting, please? Because I see the patient is uh, not cooperative with holding the breath for the most part. So this way we can see better the the final angiograms and appreciate the nephrogram. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and take a picture now. Ready, guys? This is coronary. DSA. You can see the fiber that deployed there seems to have some junk in it. You can see that something is there. So now we're going to go with the, with the device to go ahead and capture everything. But definitely the, the, the stand is deployed nicely. You can see how it tapers slowly. Okay, that is know. not bad. That is actually wanted. Remember the diameter in the, in the, uh, in the ostium, it was uh, only 5.8. Uh, uh, by by 6.2, so uh, it's a little eccentric, so it would never acc accumulate, accommodate a, a six or stent uh, uh, in full expansion. Um, so we can 
So George, uh, I think this, this is this great. Ba this basically works as a as a um, as sort of like our uh, pronto or something like that to go in and suck it out. So the coronary guys they know what a pronto is about. So what we're going to do now is we're going to we're going to enter this in. They give you a little cheater here, which is going to hopefully allow us to get this in. We obviously have a destroyed wire uh, in terms of uh, all the uh, trauma that's occurred to the wire. So now we're going to go in and hopefully are going to be able to direct it right out to this thing. If I meet resistance, okay, and it should come right out. Okay, good. Now pull out the cheater. Uh-huh, good. The wire is out. Okay. Now you don't see the wire? Uh-uh. The wire is not out? Uh, no, we took the cheater out. Why is that up? Uh -uh. Oh, because the cheater was out. You can put the cheater back in. Can we put the light here so we can put the cheater back in? Oh, let me just see if I get it out. Yeah. So as always, we have a little bit of trouble finding the second lumen. I thought the wire came out, so we removed our little cheater. <coughs> but obviously it didn't. What's our ACT, guys? There it is. So it just came out. The wire just came out. And again, you know, important thing is maintain your patience, you know. These things sometimes, you know, are not perfect. And like I said, they're not made for these arteries, you know. So sometimes you have to take up, maintain a little bit of patience. Do things perfectly. Not, you know, and uh, rail, please. Real rail. Thank you. So you want to discuss with your partner on what's happening. So now we're going to go. Now notice, as George said, we were across that stent, right? So now I'm going to open my 2E again. Can we change to coronary picture because this is very fuzzy here? Can we change to coronary uh, fluoro setting, please? Yep. We certainly are changed now, George. Yep, thanks. And uh, now I'm just going to advance this slowly. Dr. Wilde, please hold my filter, please. Just one second. Let me grab the wire here. Got it. So you're trying to retrieve the filter or you're trying to aspirate in the filter? We're trying to aspirate now, George, and I think the key to doing this is to get more coaxial into the stent like that. You saw what yeah. I did. I torqued the, 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 the actual catheter a little bit. Ray, and now, Ray, can you show them the, the, the back of it, what we have done? Okay. So you're going with what kind of catheter is this one? Uh, this is our, our aspiration catheter, which we're going to have to obviously make it a little bit more coaxial, maybe like that. Not yet. This looks like a guideliner into into the. It is the, kind of like a guideliner, but it's obviously a little it's more like bulky, a bulkier than a guideliner. Okay, okay. guys, attached now. Now Ray's going to open it. I'm going to go a little bit forward, right? Right up to the filter. Okay, suck. Open. So you can see he's sucking back. And I'm just going to let this fill as I come. Go forward a little bit. Come back a little bit. Go forward a little bit. I think that's, uh, you don't want to don't bang the stand too much there. I yeah, think that's exactly. enough. That's what happened there. I would say that's enough suction. Or maybe the patient can take a deep breath and align the, no, the we'll get thing it, better. George. We'll get it. A little bit of manip manipulation, that's yeah. all. A little bit of manipulation. We should be able to go in and out. There's no reason. It's a great catheter. So now we're going to turn it off. Now now we're going to attach the second one. And now is when I'm going to have, have we're going to have a three-step process to demonstrate today. Okay, so you're going to go ahead, uh, try to turn it, in. okay, good, perfect. Take this wire, Jose. Actually, you hold this, Jose, okay? Hold both of them. Now, I want you guys to focus on my hands here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this wire, we're going to attach it. Right, I will get there, yep. We're going to take this wire, put it all the way in till we meet resistance, like so, and then we're going to open this again. Now, that's locked our filter, okay? We're now, we're going to turn it back this way, in order for us to go ahead and, and, and drop the filter. Counterclockwise. Yeah. So the key here is, can you cycle the cuff, guys? The, I got it. Okay, the key here is, as I'm going to go forward into the filter, I'm going to ask Ray, once the syringe fills, to drop it. Okay? So now I'm in the filter now, and I'm going to pull the filter back into my retrieval device as this is filling. Okay? So drop it, please. So now here it fills. I'm going to keep it up front. Right? And I'm here, I'm just slowly, not advancing, just pulling it forward as it's filling, as it's filling, as it's filling, as it's filling. The device is coming. 
Okay, now turn it, please. Let's turn it. Turn it. Good. It's it's turning. I have a lot of trouble bringing it back here, for whatever reason. And uh, is it turned all the way? Can you push it and then pull it back a little bit again? I am. Yep. That's what I'm trying to do here, George. But it's certainly not an ideal, optimal situation here. Why? Well, yeah, for whatever I, I, reason. I guess it's ready to come straight into your guide, so just take it. Yeah, we're ready. It's in already the in the guide, so I'm just going to pull it out as a whole then. Yep. Yeah. So you know, hopefully it fits in my guide, and it does, and we're out. Okay. So obviously that wasn't the ideal filter deployment. Or, or recapture, I would say. but clearly we're able to capture most of it back oh, this a lot in, of into the filter. There's a lot of junk in the filter. Yeah, the reason I think it went, there's it, it, a lot of debris. Okay, show, show them. Yeah, look at the amount of debris that we have. It is absolutely unbelievable how much debris that we have in that particular filter. Can I have a 20cc syringe, please? Definitely a good thing uh, to, to use it in such a tight lesion. In a, it's a combination of tight lesion with a large vessel. I'm glad that we is, use this That device. makes this. Yeah. Come forward, please, with a little sailing. Wait, wait, wait. So I'm going to actually aspirate, George, my guide, because obviously yeah. it was an incomplete capture of that filter because of all the debris. Yeah. Right? So now I'm going to... Good idea to empty out the whole forward. thing and perhaps even discontinue the TUI and right. change with some kind of other... Right, I'm going to like. bleed back on the TUI as well. Come forward, please. Good. So I think this is all good technique for us to really see what's happening with what's, what's going on. Now I'm going to go low mag. Okay, now I'm going to take a nice picture of our kidney. Ready, guys? Uh, what's our pressure? Reduce it to 450, please. She's asleep, so she's on a whole lot of breath. How do you say? Okay, I'm going to wake her up for a second. Let me talk to her. Oh, I'll just talk. Ma'am, just hold your breath and don't breathe. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. And I think you got a pretty good result, George. Yeah. Yeah, we can see very right. nicely the nephrogram and uh, I think and you've got everything. a nice renal brush, you've got, you've got everything there, you've got a nice slide filter, and you have a stent that's one millimeter or two into the aorta, you've got a nice renal blush, and I think it's important now to go back and look at our pre-shot. Go see minus, please. And I'm going to have uh, uh, Dr. Wiley and, um, and Ray examine the filter and show us before we go as I, as I finish up uh, my, my final here. Minus? Minus, show me the, it's always important to go and examine the pre, as well as the post. So this is to say, Tim, we'll take this as our pre shot right here. There you go, plus. Disengage this. This is it, yep. Plus, I'm sorry, next one. There it is, now. So you can see here, a good blush with all those branches up top. Now go plus, and show me the post now. Now I really am sort of counting branches here, plus. Plus, plus, <coughs> plus, 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 okay. So here's our post shot. So I've got my branch up top. I've got my other branch going down. Yeah, definitely under. all the branches are there. The branches. I've got good renal flush. I have no knockoff of any particular branch anywhere. Yeah. So I think, you know, overall, you know, we've got a very good result here with what we've used 40 cc's of dye. And we can, we can see a little bit of spasm where the filter was deployed, but uh, I think that's a completely inconsequential. Yeah, I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think, I, I don't think that's uh, any, any trauma to the vessel there because as you see the fiber nets are very soft, for uh, soft filter. Now I want you to come here, I want to zoom in on this filter for you guys. You can see the amount of debris that's in this filter. I don't know how it's going to show to you. But, you know, we can actually flush it out with some saline. There is a tremendous amount of debris that we have captured in this filter. And where's my other stuff that we aspirated, guys? It, and it's already been, this has been emptied, and really that's pretty empty. So o overall, I got to tell you that you have that frothy, probably platelet activation stuff that's there. But I think overall, you know, we were able to demonstrate this case in a, in, in a, in a good manner in the sense that we talked about you know, in, to recap, you know, what are, what are the things that I think it's important to remember about renal artery stenting? I think first and foremost is patient selection. Check in ACT. First and foremost is patient selection. Okay, you have to pick the appropriate patient to get the appropriate clinical outcome that you want. So, in summary, patient has to have significant renal artery stenosis. 
by angiography or by ultrasound criteria that has to be greater than 60 percent. 60 percent renal artery stenosis seems to be the uh, our, our, our uh, sweet spot in terms of where it is that, that you're going to have the greatest bang for your buck. Number two, what, what, once you have the sweet spot and, you, and the patient meets criteria, then, then you want to follow proper angiographic technique. Proper angiographic techniques includes, number one, um, engaging the renal properly either with a no-touch or telescopic uh, technique. Two, ensuring good anticoagulation. Here we chose heparin instead of angiomax or bivalrudin because uh, heparin actually is reversible, God forbid we perforate or something like that. So, and all, three, make sure your ACT is higher. Obviously we kept it really high here around 300 throughout the entire procedure because we knew it would be a prolonged procedure, discussing, talking, etc. Okay, so once you've engaged, you've got your proper patient, you want to go ahead and decide between pre-dilatation and post-dilatation. So pre-dilatation uh, pre and post-dilatation, I think the algorithm is very, very simple. Can you or can you not get the stent across? Can you or can you not uh, comfortably assume that the, that the expansion of the stent is going to be guaranteed based on the characteristics of the lesion? What characteristics of the lesion can you look at fluoroscopically? Fluoroscopically, you can look at whether you have any aortic calcium that's very evident, sort of like the coronary chunk of calcium that decides uh, you know, where, when we're going to rotoblade or not rotoblade. Number two, you can use IVIS. You can use IVIS for multiple things, as Dr. Dangus so eloquently said. You can use IVIS to either two, one, vessel size, which he helped us here greatly in sizing this vessel properly, and, and, and two, and also to also tell you about the calcium. If you have a calcium dropout and you have a shelf of calcium, then you know you might have trouble expanding the stent, you may want to pre dilate okay? So, so the, the, those are important points there. Three is the use of filter, extremely controversial, okay? Extremely controversial because it has not been studied in a randomized control fashion, has not been studied in, uh, in, um, in, in terms of there's no actual filters ma manufactured for the kidney, so I think expertise is important. I think uh, I myself have probably done over 500 renal stent cases, and I can tell you that you saw the struggles that we had here. You know, it's bulky equipment, bulky wires, you know, filters that aren't appropriate for this, but in our opinion, again, in my opinion here, I think this, this filter is very well suited. Why do we feel that the FiberNet filter may be a, a good fit for this particular space? Is that the filter actually closes proximal to, uh, to, to, uh, to distal to proximal, and so therefore doesn't expand into the distal vasculature. Two, it comes on a wire, which allows you to work on that particular wire, and also is pretty torqueable, as you saw in this particular case. And, and, and number three, I think it's soft. You have a little bit of spasm here that you see in carotids all the time, and that spasm will relieve, as Dr. Dangas uh, said so well. So, once, so if you decide to use a filter, be very careful, because the complications of filters can be disastrous, such as perforation, such as dis distal dissection, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to be careful when you're using filters. So if you decide to use a filter, well, obviously, I think that there is a role. And in our algorithm, our role where we use filters are solitary functioning kidneys with, 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 uh, with high creatinine. Again, renal transplant cases with high creatinine where we're doing renal artery stenting. And obviously, in, pa in patients like this with uh, aerosol disease with high creatinine, as well as with complicated renal, such as God forbid, renal thrombosis et cetera, et cetera. So I think, I think you have to have an algorithm in your own mind and a comfort level in, into which, which filter you're going to use. So, so number four, once, once you've done it, you've sized it, you've decided about distal protection, you want to, I forgot to say, you want to pro take proper angiographic technique. You want to have a pre that shows the entire kidney and a post that shows the entire kidney so you can count all the vessels and make sure you don't have any issues. Number five, stent selection, one-to-one -one is obviously the best patency. Greater than one-to-one -one will, will cause a, a higher risk of perforation, or, or less than one-to-one -one will cause, obviously, a higher, higher restenosis. Number seven, you want to watch the patient. When you go up with a balloon, when you go up with the, with the stent, if the patient experiences back pain, if the patient vagals, if the, if the patient gets <coughs> nauseous, these are all signs of, obviously, uh, what is it called, impending renal perforation. So you have to be careful. Watch the patient, watch her, his or her reaction to what you're doing. Number eight, when you place the stent, obviously, as Dr. Dangus said, you want to be coaxial to the, to, the, to the renal artery, you want to pull the stent back, and you want to look at the inferior border of the aorta to your renal to ensure that you're going to hit the ostium. As you know, the aorta curves and it dilates as it gets further up, so therefore you may actually miss the ostium if, you don't, if you're not careful about the inferior border of the kidney. Now, number nine, make sure you go ahead and, and, and land approximately uh, one millimeter to two millimeters outside to cover the aortic flap going. Number 10, don't go above nominal. If you need to post dilate with a bigger balloon, go ahead and do so. But please do not be aggressive with, with, uh, with uh, going up to 18, 20 atmospheres. The kidneys are in coronary arteries. I know the surgeons and the, and the radiologists know this, but obviously the, the cardiologists tend to be more aggressive with ballooning because that's what we've done in the coronaries. 
Number, number 11, what, what, once you go ahead and, and deploy the scan, I want you to telescope, use the, your balloon as, as your dilator to get the guide into, into the stent so you have complete security in terms of access to that lesion. Number 12, aspirate your, your, your guide for any debris, take a nice completion angiogram, talk to the patient, see how they've done. We've also been able to go over the data with Dr. Dangus. He, he talked about the pitfalls of the, of the previous trials. We talked about Hercules trial. We're all eagerly awaiting coral. But I do believe there is a place for renal stenting. And I'm going to leave that to Jose and George to finish up with their thoughts on a place for renal stenting in the future. George, why don't you comment on that before we say goodbye? Yeah, clearly the patient selection is very, very important, as well as the 12 points that the PK made with my um, um, addition that um, you have to be attentive to all these uh, uh, tw uh, 12 points in the two minutes or less uh, it should take to complete the renal artery and uh, angiography and stent. It's really very important that this equipment don't move out in and out. You don't waste a lot of time in the renal artery. That's where, uh, you know, the... Uh, the complications come from when you are try to advance something that doesn't go have to retrieve it go back then all those are unwanted um, unwanted uh, um, uh, you know uh, maneuvers and uh, the, the less of those you do the better your outcome is going to be and the shorter your procedure is going to be you really want to have a well-planned uh, short and smooth procedure in the renal arteries. Uh, let me ask Jose for a few uh, final comments and then I'm going to close up uh, 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 right here. Jose. Yeah, uh, basically I'm going to reiterate what you guys already said. Uh, patient selection is important. Number two, technique is very important. Uh, to avoid a lot of those pitfalls from the Astro trial, the Van der Hals, uh, the, uh, which is a Dutch trial, and all these trials that had prohibitive uh, um, failure of, um, of deploying the, the, the stent and, and many uh, complications technique is very important. So uh, from the beginning to, to the end, the uh, appropriate engagement of the uh, ostium with a no-touch technique or telescoping technique, appropriate sizing, whether you use a filter or not, um, using a wire that is uh, stiff enough to provide adequate railing is uh, important in order for you to have a successful uh, uh, procedure. And, uh, you know, George, I want to thank you uh, for, for obviously all your input today. And, you know, I want to invite everybody out there. Um, I know that the, our symposium is coming on uh, June, um, you know, uh, uh, what is it, 12th, 13th, uh, 14th. And, uh, yeah, I have all the dates here, PK. Okay, a good idea Thanks, to remind George. that. Go ahead. Why don't you finish up with that? Uh, so, uh, we'll see you all you guys next week. Thank you again. All right. Great. So uh, thank you, uh, PK and team. Uh, we would like to see everybody here in the webcast again on May 22nd, the same, uh, the same time of the day. It's uh, the fourth Wednesday of May. Uh, remember that May has five Wednesdays, so uh, the, the, if, you, if you're looking for the last Wednesday, that's the 29th, but our webcast is going to be on the fourth Wednesday, which is the 22nd of May. In addition, please plan to visit New York uh, in uh, uh, June 11 to 14 in the uh, 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 Complex Coronary Vascular and Structural Cases Symposium right here at Mount Sinai. And uh, you can visit, uh, uh, as you know, you got all the lectures from last year's symposium are already on the, on the website. And uh, you can get a preview uh, of uh, how the symposium uh, feels like if you want to navigate uh, some of these uh, aspects in the website. But definitely, I can tell you the symposium feel is uh, only the corridors. And uh, any of you who want to uh, come live here, I'm, I'm certain you're going to have an incredible experience uh, in all the aspects of cardiovascular disease, structural, uh, endovascular, as well as, of course, coronary, uh, with many, many live cases uh, you know, for a, a total of uh, you know, a few days uh, in uh, mid-June. Again, the symposium, June 11 to 14, right here at Mount Sinai, and you can uh, 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 register of cccsymposium.org. cccsymposium.org. Goodbye from New York.